Go ahead and get started. Tommy's on his way, I guess. Yes, he is on his way. All right. Well, I will, uh, we have prepared, or Amy has prepared for you. She has been working really hard on a budget, I think, that is that has an eye to the future, which we are a little bit unsure of, uh, that takes into consideration a lot of factors that uh, that are out there uh, that uh, with some with some interesting new proposals. And I'm not going to steal Amy's thunder there, but there's there are some exciting things in here that she will be talking to you about that uh, that I'm very excited about. But having said that, I'll go ahead and hand the floor off to Amy and let her get started because I know you guys don't want to be here until dark. <laughs> Ms. Smith, if you would go ahead and get started then. Thank you, Mr. Young. Um, I'll just jump right into the agenda. Um, we're going to cover general fund, which is, is, of course, our largest fund. Um, we have some supplement requests, and we have a classified staff salary proposal for your review. Um, a couple of other items, uh, talking points, we've got bonuses for contracted services workers, background checks, and driver's ed. So we've had some questions come in about those items, so I've got a little information for y'all. Um, and we'll just flip on to the next page. Um, our FY22 changes in revenue, um, I'm not sure how much y'all hear from this. Um, if you read like Mr. Young and I do about education, um, when the QBE allotments for FY22 were coming out last year, when we went into our initial allotment, we took a, a cut of around $2.4 million to our QBE earnings. That means we earned it, we had the kids, we were doing everything we needed to, but they kept $2.4 million of our money. Um, it, it was a budget cut. They expected revenue to have a shortfall. Well, at midterm this year, they actually returned to us what should have been $1.4 million. Um, they alleviated part of that cut. Revenues were not cut like they thought they would, you know, came in better than they thought they would at the state level. Um, but at the same time, at our midterm, between our October FTE count and our um, March FTE count, we lost about 150 FTEs, which means students. So our net gain for our QBE for this year, for FY22, is about $1.1 million. So that has helped us tremendously. If you remember, for FY21 in the beginning, we were going to hit fund balance pretty hard at $1.4 million. The digest increase helped us out with about 600000 And then when that 1.2 um, at midterm came in, that helped, helped offset the rest of it. So we are in a good place now. We'll be this year in a very good place. And as we go into 22, it has positioned us very well to ask for um, this classified staff proposal that we have needed to do for quite some time. Um, expenditures. Uh, the significant increases in expenditures, uh, TRS is increasing by 0.75 of a percent, which is around $200,000. We have eliminated the Pearson Online program that was close to half a million. Um, we've got the proposed classified salary schedule that's $420,000 and that's salary and benefits. Um, we have a reduction of two central office positions and one counselor. So let's flip on to what I've got labeled as page one. And this, for those of you that have gone through this before, this is the same summary sheet that we've had. Um, I show you what we budgeted in FY20, what we actually spent, what we budgeted, and this is the amended budget in 21 because we did have some significant changes. What we spent to date or received today in the revenues case and what we have proposed. Um, you'll notice one line item under general administration is in bold italics. Now y'all know that means I want y'all to look at this. This category is not complete. We have some information I do not have and I'll go over that when I get to that section. But just know this is not the end total for us. This is still a working document. So let's go on to page two. This is a summary for instruction. Um, as you know, earlier this year, we amended the budget to include a new Fund 150, which is a consolidation fund, which allows us to take some federal monies and some general fund monies and put them in a pot together called Fund 150, and it relieves some of the red tape that comes with federal. This gives the schools a lot more flexibility. They liked doing it this year. They've been able to accomplish a lot of things. We've learned a lot, and so we would like to continue it. It has a net effect on general funds, so that's one reason you're going to see me have it here with general fund. 
there's a line item in each area that says transfer from fund 100 to fund 150. That is to record the expense that will be transferred out. You won't see it like this on the general ledger, but I wanted you to see what it that it does add to general fund and make sure that y'all have that fund 100 total. But overall, we have an increase in uh, salary and benefits for instructional of $940,000. And all I'll say is don't panic. Um, we did add quite a few staff members during the year. Well, I shouldn't say that. We had budgeted to reduce staff in FY21. We wound up replacing them and then all the positions we had that were just in case positions, we typically have five, we filled those two and maybe a couple more pair of pros. Um, so this covers all those changes um, from the budgeted 21 now that is the amended that's where I went back and any monies we had that I needed to transfer elsewhere to cover an additional expense somewhere else these numbers are reduced so when you see these big differences don't don't panic because there's a flip side to it elsewhere under the operating side we did pull down um, the operating cost for instruction one thing is we lost 150 students so we usually a lot of money at a so much per FTE or student at each location. So with the loss of 150, like we shouldn't have to buy as many licenses, we shouldn't have to have as much paper, pencils, whatever needs to go with it. So this is reduced slightly. Another thing is when we combine this money with that federal money, we are able to cover some of it with federal monies. And then we also are going to have quite a few positions come up in the CARES ARC grants um, they're all cared but we're trying to break them up so people know which one we're talking about but ARP is the last one that I haven't brought to you yet that is quite large at 7.1 million dollars and we are able to do quite a few things it should last from now until um, 24 so we will have some time as they, we bring in um, for example through ESS we're going to bring back some classroom paracros that's what the elementary would like to do to do more uh, small group instruction it is a proven uh, tactic to help improve instructional, um, especially ELA um, ability, uh, ELA instruction for students at that level. They really want to focus on having them on the appropriate grade level or better once they leave first grade. Mm -hmm. So any discrepancy you have, like especially kids who maybe didn't go to pre-K this year and they come into kindergarten, didn't come into kindergarten, didn't come into first grade so that we are able to address any potential learning loss issues quickly over the next three years and have everybody on on the spot where they need to be or better um, that is a mentality k-12 that if you get them on the right track in the beginning mm -hmm. then they have a tendency to stay on the right track I, I consider that absolutely if not our top priority at least it's the top three well with um, and I'll this is actually something for another day, but part of the CARES ARP Act, 20% uh, must be spent on what they define as learning loss. So those parapros, and then some additional in-classroom contracted services positions have been requested by almost every school um, so that they can take care of those learning loss issues. And um, they've got a plan. Um, they're all on board. Everybody thinks, you know, from K-12, like I said, that this is the initiative we need to have over the next three years. We do have the opportunity to do it multi-years. If it doesn't work after the first year, if we can, if we need to retool, step back, we have the right to do that. But it does help this budget. It does help those contracted paras instead of us picking them up in this budget, they're gonna be in those federal monies. That it gives us a lot more folks to put in the classroom so that the class size and the groups are smaller, um, especially at those lower grade levels. Yeah, this is great. But overall, salary and benefits and operating instruction is up $767,000. Um, every year of our certified staff, approximately 48% are eligible for a step raise, and that's based on the state and local schedule that y'all approve. So just know, in that amount, now countywide, it's about $400,000 to $425,000 a year. But most of that is concentrated in instruction because that's where we have most of our teachers. Um, 
without CARES, we're, we should have about 303 teachers, actual in the classroom teachers, or it could be a gifted uh, coordinator who comes into the classroom, works with the classroom. Um, that is two less than we had last year. Just so you know, we haven't cut major staff somewhere. Um, that equates to a 2.35% increase from the FY21 budget um, for this category. Now, do y'all have questions about instruction? This is by far our largest category. And you said two, um, two positions of the we have, we instructional. Are, yes, we have two less positions coming into 22 than we are as we end this year. We had some half-time positions and some virtual positions mm -hmm. that when you get back to the normal classroom, right. the, the numbers work okay. out. And we still have excellent class sizes, uh, especially at the lower grade levels. Okay. Great. Let's go to page, all right, page four through, I have to get glasses to see all this. Page four through, instruction, like I said, is the biggest category. Four through 32 are by school, by program code, operating budgets for every location. Um, this is that detail. I know y'all probably don't need this type of detail. We have presented this for quite some time. Um, it, it does encompass fund 10150. You will notice the high school does not have 150 because they do not qualify for the federal programs grants. Now they do qualify for CARES or ARC, but federal programs when I talk about it is typically title one, two, three, um, one, two, three, and four. Is the Georgia pre-K program part of the budget in instruction? Or? It, is, um, it is part of special revenue that we'll bring next time. It is considered a grant. Now there is a portion of it we do have to cover in general fund, and it's, it's taken care of in here. Um, the grant does not cover TRS for their employees. It did a few years ago. Sometimes they changed that. And so it cost us an FY20, I want to say it was $47,000. Um, that we picked up locally. That's what I was curious of was the what part did we actually have to fund? Um, TRS and um, some they are very strict with their budget. What the way they allocate they have you must spend a minimum of so much uh, for supplies per classroom. They have a very strict uh, schedule when it comes to teachers and teaching assistants. It's a different schedule than our teachers and our care pros are on. Um, so we have to adhere to those guidelines, but we also have to follow all their rules. So they give you X amount of money depending on how many students are enrolled, and we typically keep those. That We have three classes of 22, so we can have a max of 66, and they stay pretty topped out. Um, the, like I said, the only thing is a few years ago they changed the TRS rule where we are picking up the TRS, and we have discovered that if they want to do a school-wide um, professional learning event, they have professional learning for their staff, and it's very specific too. They must attend the, 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 the. It does not cover um, any other things that we would like them to go through, whether it be mindset or um, a, a general training. If it comes to a software program they might be using that we're sharing with them, um, we, we pick up those costs too. If they're minimal. Um, subs, we're, they're allotted so many uh, days of substitutes. It covers the PL part, but not if they're sick, typically. So we, we do cover a few things. Like I said, I believe last year the total cost was around 47000 20 if I remember correctly. Okay. okay. I know instruction is that giant category, so if y'all have any, any questions, I do want you, when you, when you have time, <coughs> feel frisky and don't have anything else to do. If you'll look through what our schools are doing, um, you're going to see a difference this year, and Fund 150 is going to be um, for basically substitutes, contracted parapros that are through ESS instead of a salaried employee. Um, the 150 fund is truly what will be in that classroom, what, this, what the schools have asked for, and they are combined with those federal monies. So they've got that one pot. It's a lot clearer and easier if they have all their instructional funds in one area and you're not trying to say, oh, this goes in 100 and this goes in 150. 
Um, it's all lumped in together. Um, I think the principals and the bookkeepers especially will, this will make it a lot more convenient for them, a lot easier in processing purchase orders, um, a lot clearer where their budget stands at any given time. What we're going to keep in 100 are um, things like um, special education QBE allotment because it can change and sometimes we just have to pay for what we just have to pay for. Um, it, it doesn't matter sometimes if you're out of money we still have to take care of something. Substitutes have been a, a challenge the last couple of years. During COVID we really did not spend that much money. Um, obviously if somebody was working from home and maybe didn't feel good they didn't necessarily have to have a sub. But we did have situations where we had someone that was quarantined working from home, but we needed a body in a classroom. So it has been one of those things that uh, it's been a moving target, but we were still way well within budget for that. We are budgeting as though we are going to be in normal school and will not be sent back and forth. Um, I think that's just a conservative approach to make sure we can cover those expenses. Please God. Um, this, do you have any questions about instruction? Okay. If y'all will flip to page 33. This is pupil services. In pupil services, um, the operating expenses at the school level are for the nurses, for um, attendance, data clerks, counselors, office, central office operating expenses when it comes to social workers, uh, countywide testing, um, uh, items like that. As you see, the school budgets are very small. That is just for the counselor. Um, that is all that budget is for. Central office picks up. We now have a separate nursing category, so it does not interfere with their funds. Uh, of course, the county nurse oversees that. Um, the central office operating money, the school social workers, anything they need when it comes to uh, tribunal training, when it comes to um, any office supplies, uh, we have social workers go to training events, things like that. <coughs> hospital homebound <coughs> mileage for our staff to go to uh, teach kids on hospital homebound status. We do reimburse them for their mileage and it is in this category. Um, testing supplies, whether it's gifted or lollipop or whatever type of test that is administered at, at the county level. There are some benchmarking things they do at schools through certain programs, so we let that stay in the schools in the 1,000 budget. If it's more of a county countywide initiative, we pick it up here. It's minimal. We do cover the AP test uh, for the high school because it actually isn't just for the high school. It, it can be for um, whoever qualifies. Oh, we didn't do that anymore. We, we have never stopped. We pay what it is. There's a there's a reduced. We pay for the first test. Maybe we pay for the first. After that, or there, there is a they have a plan. If there is a need, and it can be identified, and it is recommended by staff um, for a student if they cannot pay, there's a portion of students pay um, after the first test. But if it is something someone who should and we deem appropriate to pay for additional tests, we will cover it. We used to pay all tests. Now, we did back off of that. They, they can't just take all four and us pay for all four and, and maybe then not show up. Um, yeah, we will pay for the first one, and then there, it's very specific on who can qualify for additional. There has to be a, a need identified. I'm a little surprised. I, I don't care. I'm not fussing about it, but uh, since OT and PTs are in this category, since OT and PT are, uh, services are in an IEP, I'm, I'm a little surprised that it's under the school category instead of the special education category. Well, all OT and PT is not for SPED. Well, that's, that's we can, true. We can have uh, students who do not qualify. Yeah. We do have the advantage if parents will allow us to. If they will allow us to claim their student as Medicaid eligible. They have to be Medicaid eligible under Medicaid's requirements. If the parents will allow us and we're providing the service, we can potentially earn back up to around 40% of the cost of the service. Okay. Now, we have to do um, paperwork, of course, to claim that, but that is in this category. So, we, um, when on the next page, um, you'll actually see on page 30, oh, yeah, the glasses are becoming a requirement. The central office 
section actually defines age. So it's not just for educational purposes, no. it could be medical um, purposes as well. On page 44, uh -huh. under contracted services, you're going to see an amount there, 130000 for uh, PT and OT. Uh -huh. Of that, we can earn back a portion of that money, like I said, you, if it's not Medicaid eligible uh, and it's not SPED eligible, because some of these funds do get booked into special education. Right. But some, if you claim Medicaid, you can't put that part in FED. You have to put it in in the state in this local part. Right. And then we can get the reimbursement for that. So if we are paying for a portion of it under federal monies, you cannot claim it. Uh, you cannot claim a portion of it back. So we. We house it here, and then we basically almost wipe it back out. There is a local cost, but we do record the revenue on, on uh, the first page in the revenue section. You'll see I know Medicaid. We track it. You're never going to earn it all because it's just not a program set up that way. You're never going to have all the students that are Medicaid eligible. But we do try to break down and buffer that cost. So um, the revenue comes in in one area and expense comes in another. So I do have to budget it as an expense. Because it is a large item now. And once again, I am so thankful that you're in that seat and I am not. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I want to answer you. that question all the time. But, um, okay, I know we're bouncing around a little bit, but yeah, so. when we went to page 44, so we're talking about okay. the student code of conduct production. Yes. It's only $8,500, but I thought we quit producing code. I thought we'd provide e copy. That was a discuss the last two or three years. Um, <clears throat> there were some concerns when I spoke, and, and, and I will say it kind of changes with superintendent too. So it does have to do with what we can legally do when we need a disclosure signed and returned. Um, there are some legal issues to do with it. I would probably have to pull somebody in to, to have them explain all the issues that have come up. We have to have a paper copy in each classroom. You have to have one for every And they have budget. to be available to anybody that wants a paper copy. So we want all staff to have it, all bus drivers to have one on the bus, all students to have access to it if someone walks in. So this was the cost that it was last year. If it turns out that we're not going to do that and we haven't finalized the budget, we can reduce this. But as of last year, we did have this. It was almost exactly $8,500. I just know we had had this conversation. Right. Yes, yeah. we do them electronic. Yeah, that's what. But I, we're I required by code. Some paper copies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're required yeah. by code to have a certain I a certain think, number of paper copies. Kind of like with registration in general, I know a lot of systems do do a virtual registration now, mm -hmm. but they still have to offer the availability of getting yeah. paper. And we have to have one in each classroom. I have to have paper copy in each and classroom. Also, do we also have one on each bus? I know we give them to every bus driver. We give them, to, yeah. The bus drivers have it. I don't know if they keep it with them on the bus. Um, in central office, while we're on page 44, I'll go ahead and run through some of it. Uh, UJ extension. We do have um, uh, an extension agent and an assistant. Um, this is our portion. Um, are they going to hire? Well, I have been told they are. I just had a conversation with uh, One thing to budget, are they going to fill the position? <laughs> well, and, and it wasn't filled quite a bit this past year, but they do. we do actually have people contacting us. Uh, we did receive the contract um, for both positions. We actually got three things at one time that we usually get like six months apart, and I, I was emailing going, whoa, 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 tell me how much this is, and am I reading this wrong, and we don't normally get it all at one time. But this was the estimated cost. The county does share half the expense for one of the positions. The other one is a part-time position that we do pick up. Um, the principals still say they think it's a, a, a valid program that we need to have and offer the students. So um, as long as y'all vote for it, we will continue that. But they are actually interviewing and trying to fill those two positions. That's right. good. This will take it for a while. Yes, it has. Um, we do have a discipline data program, um, and then part of the student information system we, uh, is currently uh, in the campus. It goes under the 532 web-based subscriptions now. And then we have an RTI program um, that is in that category also. And you may know sometimes we actually move things around. One program that we had in the 532 web-based subscriptions category we are no longer using, so we did eliminate that so it would save us a little bit of money. Um, 
overall the operating budget for central office went down about 10 percent the schools all held very close to the same the nursing budget held very close to the same overall we still have a 12.56 percent reduction in operating and it is a very small category it's not a lot of money the increase at the top has straight up to do with the classified salary schedule increase the trs increase and if any certified staff in that category was eligible for a step. So um, I did move a position, a portion of a position from uh, function 2800, which is central support, to this position because as we have collapsed the position in the central office, that job is being disseminated out to other people. So when other people take it and they're transitions and maybe they're only doing one piece of something, I have to look at their job description of what they're doing and have to figure out where to place them so you're going to see several comments about i have moved a portion of a position a, a position from here to there the number of positions only went down by two <laughs> so the rest of them i'm just having to move where their job description appropriately places them when it comes to state definition so i'm um, losing the um, chief of accountability and in the assistant superintendent position those duties have been disseminated out from the staff so this is what makes it so very difficult when when we do get requests from the from citizens to compare office staff positions right. from previous years mm -hmm. to what we have now because we're not comparing apples to apples right. when when they've done that before what i had to do was just i go through every category and i can pull payroll and look at uh, who's coded to our location um, and that's usually how we start the process is everybody who's linked to our location i pull them all into one spreadsheet and then we start to go from there because they are they can be spread you can i'm coded as business services but i have people who work under me who are coded to central support to uh, improvement of instruction. I mean, it's scattered, so you, you do have to, okay, this one's here and this one's here, but we have to stick with the state definition. I'll give you a really strange one. Counselors' supply money is in 2100 people services, but their salary and benefits are in 1000. That's state rule, not mine. But that's an example of how we, just, we have to follow the rules with this. Um, because they consider them instructional support but then supplies for instruction should be directly in the classroom mm -hmm. where people services it is a support for like the counselor supplies are a support for the students so i won't win that argument with with the state but that's how it's defined right now so that's how we budget yeah. um, i'm going to back up to our summary page for 2100 page sorry I'm, I'm going to make an index in the future so that we can all keep up with what page back to page 33 um, like I said we had a slight increase in uh, salaries and benefits of 6.82 percent the grand total for people services is up 3.15 percent which is actually $60,112 you have any other questions on 2100 nursing I will just give you an update on nursing um, we are keeping certain um, supply items in place um, since we have been dealing with COVID this year that budget doubled um, in FY20 excuse me 21 we are we cut about thirteen hundred dollars to have to do with travel but we're going to leave that in place just in case um, it is it is a place they take care of replacing all the batteries and the pads on every aed we have in the system those are worked into their um, budget by location but um, they they are doing training but most of it is virtual next year and they already know that um, we will support that of course but um, because of the services they provide in the atmosphere we have right now we feel it's appropriate to leave that money in place it's twenty three thousand dollars in the grand scheme of a fifty million dollar budget so um, that is what we would like to do at this time i'd rather i'd rather have it in there and be conservative and, and not need it right than to need it not have it okay. on page 45 
This is improvement of instruction. In the salary and benefit area, this covers your curriculum director, um, a portion of your federal programs director. Um, there's some clerical staff that goes along with this. We actually have three clerical positions. One has to do with special education, a portion of your special education um, department is in this category. As you see though, we moved a portion of one position. Um, our federal programs director, because of what's going on uh, with federal programs in CARES and ARC, it has become so massive. Um, we have realized that where we've been picking her up 50% in general fund, 50% in federal, next year is going to be a very different story. She may be as much as 90-10 uh, to the federal side. We have conservatively said 75-25. She and her uh, assistant, who was supposed to be half mine, is now hers. <laughs> because what's coming, the paperwork is coming, she is going to, be going to need that support. So that is the move portion of the position to federal. So that did help reduce um, the salary and benefits in this category. The operating expenses, you have your technology uh, budget. Now this is the general fund budget. We will have additional um, additional technology requests when we come to SPLOS. They usually pick up all the purchase of new equipment, servers, computers, printers, all those things. So this is just anything that is an annual renewable um, it cannot be in SWAPs. It has to be in general funds. So this is all the annual renewables, and you can see his detail on page 46. He actually, um, his request was reducing his budget by almost 13%. The other operating expense in this category is part of staff development. And it's only the part of staff development that is linked to the salaries of the people who are in 2210. The way state staff development works now, Wherever that person is coded as a function code, so like I'm 2,500, Mr. Young is 2,300, um, uh, personnel is 2,800, you actually have to use that function code. So I've had to break apart our $117,000 staff development budget into all the places it should go. Um, and if we go to page 47, instructional staff training, this is a, a, a part that is actually for anyone who's in the classroom, and that can be teachers, parapros, counselors, media specialists, what they consider instructional staff. So that is a portion of our staff development. You're also going to see Fund 150 in this category, and it's for the academic coaches. We have consolidated those academic coaches from federal money, but all this money will actually go out to federal and does not increase Fund 100 in this area. Overall for 2210, it's a reduction of 36,126. Most of that is related to the technology request being decreased and the portion of the federal program directly being moved to federal. Do y'all have any questions on that area? We reviewed page 47, which is instructional staff. Like I said, it is a portion of staff development, and that's usually why I talk about them together. Page 48, um, any given year, this can change radically. If we do an initiative to, to train our instructional staff, this number can change. So when it says it goes up or down, it's not a major event. We are given that money. We earn that money. This is part of that, and we are within, I believe it was $4 of what they um, I just round it up a little bit so that I stay sane sometimes, but, but um, we do a lot what we earn. We also can have some additional staff development money. Um, it's not state, but at the federal level, um, we may be able to push some more out at the federal level. This year, we, are, we have not utilized all of our staff development money. So much of it is um, for registration and then the tra um, travel part. Of course, travel was almost non-existent most of this past year, so um, we have not expended uh, about $40,000 of this year's budget at this time. Now, they still have time until the end of June. Uh, we have had a few more requests coming in recently. Okay, page 49 is media services, and of course, this is for our media centers. 
The top section, salary and benefits, you'll see an increase of 2.47%. And again, it's directly, it's not any change of any number of staff. It's any certified that had a step increase, non-certified, the new schedule that we're recommending, and the TRS increase of 0.75%. Now the bottom area um, is the media budget per school. And you'll see um, we earn $57,222 to support those six media centers. We are just a shade above that. It is a reduction from prior years. If we are able to push out any additional funds anywhere, I would like to push some more funds here. Their software program for each location, by location, is over $1,300 a year. It just does not give them a lot of money to either purchase subscriptions um, that allow access for students to books or supplies in the actual media center where all of our students go at different times during the year. So we did cut them a little bit, um, but if we have any monies left, I would like to push it, it, maybe even just $10,000 back out to the schools. I think it would help them a lot. Mm -hmm. um, this budget was actually reduced by over 50% over the years. <clears throat> So this is just not a lot of money. Our PTOs are excellent at helping us with this. When they do book fairs, they will actually turn around and help us either donate the money to our schools or purchase for us. Um, so that helps sustain this program. But we do need to turn over um, the books in the library quite often. Uh, as you know, once they're handled a few hundred times over the years by students, we do have wear and tear. A lot of it is more digital, but there's nothing like having a real book in your hand, especially at a younger age, um, when you can see the colors and um, the things that go with it. But that would that would be my request if we could push maybe ten thousand dollars back out to that area, or more. Again, the six pages, six or seven pages behind this, are the by school request for the media centers. Y'all have any questions about media? Page 56 is general administration. Now this is where I have a gap. I do not have information right now on superintendent salary and benefits. That is a large piece of this category. This category, salary wise, covers the superintendent. If you have an assistant superintendent, which we have eliminated, um, the administrative assistant for the superintendent and the board attorney. So those are the only positions that are paid in this category. So um, having the head honcho not in here takes a chunk out of uh, the budget. So I have just put to be determined. In the operating area, it is any operating cost that supports the superintendent's office and these, these, these three people. So our e-board that we use to push the board meeting out, uh, GSBA policy um, maintenance service, we do pay for that, so they do contact tech us if there needs to be a policy in the <coughs> so that we can uh, review that, and any uh, outside attorney's fees. It also covers the board members and administrator legal liability insurance. We did have an increase this year in that cost. Um, travel to training for board members and the superintendent and staff. Any office supplies, um, equipment, we, we purchase Georgia School law books typically, and then any memberships that have directly to do with the superintendent's office. So there was a 0.32% increase in operating, but I don't even want to talk about the percentage decrease because we, it is incomplete and we will need to fill that in um, before we can actually approve a tentative budget um, or actually even have our public hearings. And I did note that this reduction that you see, the decrease of over 700,000, is a decrease from the amended budget, not from the initial. Y'all have questions about that? Either? How much is the e board and GSBA subscriptions? Um, I think it's listed here. I believe it's. Uh, 12 to 13,000 per year. I believe it's right at 13,000 for the coming year. 
and that provides we buy the whole package where you know we have policy and we can see other counties policies um, we have full support there we can contact them they they help us um, um, Martha's not even here. I was going to say, Martha, um, we all our uh, people who are like I produce reports for the board meeting. I can go out there and attach my reports. Martha does a review and actually approves them. Um, but that way we can see working documents. You can go ahead and be uploading things ahead of time. Um, it also creates a historical record. Uh, it has all our minutes. Like when audit comes, they don't ask me for minutes unless they haven't been approved yet because they go out to eboard and pull them. Uh, on their own, but it records all of our agendas, the minutes, the, um, all of the record we had for quite a few years, all of our policies. Y'all have any other questions? Okay, let's go to page 59. This is school administration. In this category, of course, are your principal, assistant principal, receptionist, school bookkeepers, um, anybody else I believe that's all of the staff but at every school location this is very specific to school offices no other uh, no other offices um, the increase is 3.21 percent again the same three reasons we have uh, in the other categories either the certified people had a, were eligible for a step increase on the, take, uh, the approved schedule the non-certified pay increase proposal that we have out there and the TRS increase for the coming year. At the bottom are the operating expenses by school. Um, they are down slightly a little less than 3%. But our grand total expense, it was an increase of 2.94% or about $80,334. The schools and their operating money, they do pay for their phones, cell phones, their postage, any supplies, they need paper, um, postage, um, anything to do directly in that school office. Behind page 60 are again, five school locations, individual budgets for each school. And that goes through page 66. <coughs> And as I said a few minutes ago, when it comes to training for your administration, those state staff development funds get pushed into this category. So you will see travel to professional learning activities and registration. Okay, any questions? Page 67, business services. Um, this is my department. This is where uh, budgeting, financial, property, accounting, payroll, inventory, control, internal auditing, uh, man any management of funds, um, purchasing, uh, all of those things. And this is the, the part to process these things. For example, we have a financial software system uh, that's through Harris Solutions. That cost is in our operating money. Um, if we need any supplies to produce W-2s, 1099s, payroll checks, accounts payable checks, any of those things, they're in this category. It's a smaller category. There are only five people in this category, including me. Um, the salary increase is 1.48%, and again, that's driven off that non the classified salary schedule proposal. Operating, we did have to bump up operating just a little bit. In FY21, it was the first year we had had to have a SPLOS audit, a separate audit just for SPLOS funds. So we did bring in um, a firm to do that. The cost is about $7,000 a year. Um, at the time, we did not know it would be quite that much, and we had a little bit of an increase on our financial software, so we are having to ask for an increase here. Um, we did ask for an increase in um, uh, um, supplies just because we have we used to have four people now we have five we have a little more expense related to that but overall it's a request for fourteen thousand three hundred seventy dollars for salary and benefits and operating okay page 69 this is maintenance and operations 
I did move a half a position to um, from 2800 to this because of the secretary that works with our operations supervisor, our chief of operations, um, used to kind of split some duties and, and do some other things that would qualify her for central office support. Most of the time now, she is, mo she is mainly MNO. Um, because of that, I have moved her. Um, it does reduce 2800 central support, but when most of her duties, when, when the predominantly most of her duties falls under MNO, I needed to I needed to change just her classification. It's an increase at the top of 9.62% in salary and benefits. This also is where all of our maintenance staff is housed. We have seven maintenance staff. In operating, pretty much everything in operating stayed the same with the exception of energy. At this point last year, CARES 1 came into play, and we were able to cover po a portion of our utilities. So we had $900,000 budgeted for power and gas, basically. Um, that grant ran about, we were going to be able to use about $745,000 toward utilities. So we reduced this budget, and it left $155,000. Since then, with the combination of CARES 1 and CARES 2, we were able to cover the whole 900000 ish We're not done with the year. But we will be able to take care of all of it. So we were able to reduce this budget by 155000 for that item. Now, we'll be able, under what we are proposing with CARES and ARC, to cover this through 24. So someday, this cost is going to come back to general fund. I can't make utilities go away. Um, so I just kind of a note, and I've got a note out to the right that this has been shifted to CARES. It is an allowable expense. It's called um, continuation of core services. Um, we were have been approved in the first two grants, and I, I, um, I think the second grant, we're just going to leave it in there, and it's covering the next three years. If we have enough money, we're going to reach back out and grab uh, water and super too. Overall, it's a reduction of $69,500. Um, they did bump up a couple of uh, places. The software went from $18,500 to uh, $25,000. They have um, ShoutPoint. We, we budgeted here. It's our messenger. It's our, it's our software that calls folks and notifies them, especially when there's a weather event or any other kind. Lots of different departments use it for different reasons, but the main one was safety and security <coughs> into uh, weather events and cancellation of school. So that's why it's housed here. Uh, there's a work order program, and then there's also a safety program that is connected to this that has to do with our cameras. So that's a reduction of about $69,500. Do y'all have other questions? Hey, Looks Jeff. like that item, other equipment, has been going over the last few years. It, it is, it's a moving target with that, you know, some of those have to do with unexpected events that happen. We usually try to put some money there. Um, with energy, we usually had some money to push and pull around. You know, we do a higher estimate on our energy based on what's going on with the cost. But we never want to not have enough money to pay the power bill. Um, the way the state rules are, if it is used in this fiscal year, July 1st to June 30th, we are to pay it in this year. So we should have 12 power bills, 12 water bills. I mean, each company, we have more than one company for some of these things, but you should be able to tick off your 12 months expense. Um, so sometimes we need to rent equipment if we need a scissor lift. Um, I know we had a piece of equipment that went down and it was not, or we could not buy something quickly and they needed it for a purpose and so they did rent a piece of equipment. We try not to do that a whole lot, but we also don't want to buy a thirty thousand dollar piece of equipment if we're going to use it twice. So. Well, that wouldn't make sense. It's just on the other equipment, the small equipment. It looks like we've been going over consistently in recent years. I'm just wondering if that budget allocation is enough, though it's not a, a huge amount of money to steal. Right now, these these um, what's asked for here is comes from the department, so they try to anticipate what's coming for the next year. Um, one thing about N&O is there are certain repair and maintenance things 
that can happen that we can fund out of SPLOS. We will have an m and budget in SPLOS. So it gives them a little wiggle room. If a major um, event happens, we will always come back and ask for an amendment to either general fund or SPLOS to cover that. But um, at this time, he felt like that was appropriate. I do know they, they have bought a few things the last few years to kind of try to keep that uh, from happening to us, but it's not large. No, that would be like specific tools in a bush, and garage, and things like that. Diagnostic tools, especially. Right. Now that's coming in the next category. Um, and on page 71, we'll just jump into transportation. Salary and benefits. Uh, this is to fund 61 drivers, six full time subs, um, extracurricular activities. Um, we have four mechanics, 10 monitors, four office people including the supervisor and four shop gentlemen uh, including the shop foreman with the new salary schedule uh, it would create none of these folks are certified uh, certified as in state certified PSC but it would cause an increase of 2.78 percent in the operating area this budget state almost exactly, well it did say exactly the same. Um, again, it's one of those things when it comes to fuel, when fuel costs go up, we do have to monitor that. Uh, we've been very comfortable even though we had our little event recently with fuel. We had just filled up and, uh, all our tanks uh, the week before all that happened with the fuel, the gas, and the diesel. Um, what we typically do is we'll try to top our tanks off before summer, but if the cost is too high, we might wait a little bit. Um, it, it, I, we, do, we do a bid, so it's at the discretion of um, whether we need it during the summer. We do still run buses during the summer. We do um, various programs, so we do need some fuel, but we like to top those tanks off if we can, but if it's too expensive, we won't do it. We'll wait until later to see if the cost will come down. But this is a 2.16% increase, which is $74,625. Page 73. This is central support. So this is a portion of the central office. Um, office activities other than general administration, which is the superintendent's office, and business services, which is my department, um, are it's mostly for personnel, data processing, strategic planning, development and evaluation. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example of something I think is kind of strange the way they do it, but uh, Director of Op Chief of Operations is actually coded in this category. Um, we moved to half a position, which was the assistant for the uh, for uh, MNO. We did move a half a position out to 2600. We moved a position from Object Code 190 to 142 because of a change of personnel and job description. And then we also eliminated a position under management. This is where that uh, chief of accountability was budgeted, so that position has been eliminated. It is a reduction of 25.21% of our salaries <coughs> and benefits. We have a slight increase in the operating area. And that is for communications. Um, we have installed VoIP phones. So we are all learning to cut people off right now. <laughs> um, the buttons and the placement, is where the cutoff button used to be is now a different button. So I have cut a few people off. Um, but it's a, um, an internet-based system. Um, we are still doing changeover. There's a cost estimate that there should be an increase because each person actually has a line now instead of us just having 10 lines in every every employee has a direct line a direct number so this is an estimate at this time we do not have a full month's bill on anybody we have it installed the last bill we received it was partially installed at two two schools and partially installed here so we should have some whole bills um, pretty soon, but I have increased it by about 20% for that reason, uh, just for that uh, phone category, and that is what drove the increase. The, the install of the initial purchase of equipment is all spots. So. Right. You just any recurring charge you can. Right. Uh, 
push out. We might be able to pick apart a little bit more of the bills and move some more to squats, but um, trying to get a handle. They're still adding and removing lines and, and doing planning at other locations, so it's hard to get a, a grip on it, but we had estimated in the beginning it would be about a 20% increase. So I'm gonna stick with that for the moment. If we can pull it down, we will. Um, but it's still a moving target. <coughs> We uh, have something, uh, we have a web-based application system, we have a Safe Schools training module, and we have a CPI tracker we use as software uh, under this office or this section. Um, all that cost data about the same. Overall, it's a 19.71% decrease for the category, and um, that is $169,420. Pretty good. Y'all quiet today. Um, page 76 is other support services. We have one item here. This is our RESA support. Um, they help us out with retraining. Um, if we need information on our RESA district, we can reach out to them. They provide a lot of essential services. This cost is based on our FTE count, and it, we have been under $20,000 for years. So. We are safe to once again put 20,000 in that category. Now, before we go to supplements, I want you to jump back to page one. This is that summary sheet for all the categories we just talked about. One as I discussed a little while ago, one thing that helped us this year is we had an increase in our QBE allotment. It netted an, an increase of about 1.1 million. Um, another item I want you to see, because I'm being very conservative with this, is local other taxes. In this category is TABIT, which used to be the motor vehicle tax, um, real estate transfer and intangible tax, which has to do with changes in mortgage and buying and selling of homes. Um, uh, we also have railroad, railroad car equipment and forest land protection, and they stay essentially the same. There has been, we have almost doubled this year what we typically receive in real estate transfer tax and intangible tax. Um, my assumption, knowing the market in the area, is as people refinance their homes for a lower rate, or they buy or sell their home, you are, these fees are incurred. It has <coughs> doubled, maybe more than doubled now. I am concerned about increasing that too much because I don't know the future of what that will be. I looked back over a five year trend and we have essentially earned almost the exact same amount of money. So I increased it slightly. If I over, budget revenue and it doesn't come in and it matches our expense then I can't spend money somewhere and I won't know that until the end of the year um, so I was conservative with the increase TABIT has also increased significantly so we actually did we did trends on both these areas and so I have increased this this category by 600,000 for the year we will earn more than that in this year, but I'm concerned about it sustaining itself through all of next year. So this is a conservative increase. If there's um, another housing bubble, bottom of the top Absolutely. We're going to stay conservative. Absolutely. I just want to make sure whatever we need to expend, that we have the revenue to cover it. I don't want to overextend that revenue. You know, it's like QBE. I, I can be pretty certain that we're going to get what they have told me. They, we have our, our QB allotment sheet in here on our initial. Um, if something drastic happens, of course, they let us know when we can change our game. But um, with this, because of the market, and I've, I've read quite a few articles, everyone's all over the place with this. There are people that think this will sustain for years, and there are people that think it can't last. So just to protect the system, I have done a very conservative estimate on the increase. I'm even, I, I, I fought with, uh, with this one, and it's one line item, and I fought with it for quite a while. But I think this will keep us safe. 
Um, I have estimated our revenue for ad valorem at what it was this year because we do not have a tax digest. Um, you know, we do our budget. When the digest comes in, we do the math problem and, and see what happens. Um, that's what you're supposed to do. So if you come in higher or lower, if it comes in lower, we will need to maybe drop back and, and rethink some things. Um, if it comes in higher because of that real estate transfer tax and intangible tax, that tells me something's moving. Uh, quite a few sales in the area. There's a lot of building going on. I think the digest will be up again. Um, so we will, we will wait and see. Hopefully we'll get that in July or August. Overall, we do still have that one large item we have not budgeted in 2300. Um, we, our expense at this moment is less than what I have budgeted in revenue. It's about $378,000. We do have that one large item. We have a couple of other issues we need to talk about to see if it's something we want to add to the budget. Like I said, and if I have an opportunity, I'd really like to push it out 10000 back to media if I can. Um, but let's flip over to our other items. Um, page 77, supplements. <coughs> now, behind page 77, through page 85, are supplements. Almost every single one of them are exactly as they were this year. But we have a couple of requests that have come from two schools. Uh, page 77 details this. Uh, PHS Athletics is requesting the addition of one month to each of the football defensive and offensive coordinator <coughs> positions. I'm under the impression that y'all have heard this. Is this moving them to 11 months or yes. moving them from 11? No, moving them to okay. 11. They, they, I, they, say, I thought they, we'd already moved them to 11. I thought we'd already approved that. Yeah. It, it had not been approved, or I can't find a record of it. So, this is part of it. I thought we, that's why I was about to say, you might move them to 12 months, because I don't, I don't call us moving them to 11. Sometime. And, and if it was 422, I just <clears> cannot find Was it maybe when they were? If it went through personnel. It might have not been budget, it might have been personnel. Right. But I, I haven't found what I need, so I'm presenting this for 22. This is for the 22 budget. Yes, okay. this is for the 22 budget. This is just to make sure we've covered. Okay. But it's still 11 months. Yes, it is moving them from no additional days and a 10 month teacher to an 11 month schedule. They do still get a supplement. All those supplements are reflected on page 78. Um, when I have a change in something, I will put it in bold italics to get your attention. Another thing they wanted to do uh, that has to do, oh, the addition of the two additional months is about $15,400. They would like to remove the PHS assistant director supplement of 1000 And then they wanted to rearrange some of the football um, supplements. And I've got, I've got 21s on page 78 and what they were asking for for 22. Now this came from the high school athletic or the county athletic director. It is not increasing any other monies other than adding those two months. They just wanted to rename, reassign tasks, and redistribute the funds. So it's not an additional cost for that part. But to change the name and the amount, I have to present it and y'all have to approve it. And we're not asking for approval today. The other request from high school athletic, athletics is to increase days for the PHS girls and boys head basketball coaches. They currently receive a half month in a supplement and they, they would like to increase it to a full month in a supplement. And that would add approximately $8,760. The total for all requests is a net of $23,160 and I've already incorporated it in the budget. And out of that 23,160, I mean, how much is what we had already approved as far as personnel? Because we had already approved the 11 for the two. For 15, 15,400. So. So it's just, uh, 80, it's actually 7,760 when you net out the reduction of one supplement. Do y'all have any questions on that? The only other request I have in regards to supplements. Uh, Pickens Junior High School 
would like to request an increase to their yearbook supervisor supplement from five hundred to five hundred dollars a year to seven hundred and fifty. And he would like to add five department chair supplements in the amount of five hundred dollars each. He is um, developing his departments in a similar manner to the high school. The high school uh, department chairs uh, receive seven hundred and fifty dollars, and there are more than five. I um, believe there are eight. Um, he is going along the same manner, trying to with his school, trying to get those department heads. They're the ones that reach out to the teachers. Like when it comes to budget, he contacts the department head. They go out to each one. It is additional responsibilities um, outside their normal responsibilities as, as a teacher. Um, like I said, he has asked for that in uh, his yearbook. It is a little more. It is larger. The high school's yearbook supplement is fourteen hundred. K six schools each have a yearbook supervisor um, paid five hundred. This is the second largest school. Um, it does seem to go along <coughs> with uh, the theme. Of all all these schools are close, very close to the same size. Then PJ is quite a bit bigger, and then the high school, of course, is very large. But all together, um, Pickens Junior High School's request total about thirty-five hundred thirty-four dollars, and this includes salary and benefits that would be related. All the rest of the supplements you see listed here were already approved in twenty-one, and there are no changes other than on a we want to change the title on one on the page eighty-one. We have a supplement for virtual and social emotional learning, and we request to change the title to PACE Coordinator. It doesn't change dollar amount, it just changes the title. Y'all have any, any questions about any of the supplements? These will not be official until one of two things happens. Um, if we do a tentative budget approval and you approve as a whole the budget, you will, you will have also approved these supplements. If we are, if we get into a situation where we're running under a spending resolution and we need to pay some of these supplements because some of these are for 12 month staff, then we would have to pull these out into a budget item and ask you to approve them separately just so we have approval to pay them uh, before um, we get a, a tentative budget approval. Um, any other any questions? Right, moving on to page 86. I had three different requests uh, about different items. One is um, to calculate the cost of providing a bonus pay for contracted services personnel. We, I'm sorry. Or is it, on 84, it is small money, but the, uh, the proposed increases for some of the high school department is, but I, just really, I wasn't sure why it's so. It's, it's not increases. This schedule, uh, at one time, when it came to department heads, uh, actually all of them, um, there was a step schedule every year where you got an increase of either $25, 50 100 or $250. We did away with that schedule quite a few years ago, but we still have staff that had earned additional monies above what we call the base supplement. They are still holding those positions, and in the past, the board did not want to take money from the staff. So as long as they stayed in that position, they're still earning that. Those are the ones with the asterisks by them. If those people retire or resign this year and a new person is appointed, they go back to the base. Mm -hmm. So very slowly, we are eliminating this. I just didn't understand why some were. Yeah, that's Page 86, um, we had a request for information regarding uh, bonus pay for contracted services personnel. We have approximately 68 as of 414 and 21, because that's the date we paid our employees. Uh, we have 31 uh, personnel with ABM, 17 with ESS, 
and 20 individual contracts that span anywhere from special ed services, OTPT. Um, we have instructional support in a classroom through um, consolidated funding or through a federal grant. Um, but I was asked to produce the cost of a $500 bonus or a $1,000 bonus. Um, ABM would not charge us an upcharge to, we would have to renegotiate the contract with each one of these. Every one of them, you have to have an amendment to the contract because we have specific terms. Um, come to an agreement, so we've already talked to ABM and ESS. ABM said they would not charge us anything additional, they would, you know, we would amend the contract, we would be billed, we would pay the bill, there's no additional charge. ESS will upcharge us 18% on whatever the amount is. Um, and then we have 20 individual contracts, and I do want to make a comment after talking to some of the departments that have to do with this. It's still amending every single contract. Um, some of these contracts, especially the ones that are in consolidated funding that have some connection to federal, number one, we cannot hit those grants for any of this. It has to come from local money. Um, it can't be CARES money. It can be ARP money. But some of these contracts are for nine hours of support a week, and the departments did not feel like it was appropriate to pay a, if a full-time person was receiving a $500,000 bonus that, of someone who does part-time. We have quite a few of that 20 that are 20 hours or less a week. Um, there are some that are close to full-time. So that is something I would ask, if it's something that we choose to do, that maybe we, re, we visit, revisit that a little bit more to see from the departments how they feel about it. That's the only one I had one in particular, just like, I got people coming for, I think the lowest was nine, but up to 20 hours, and said, you know, you cannot hit my federal grant with it, and I said, I understand that, so. Everybody knows that my view is that I think we need to do this in some regard or another. My, I, I'm glad you point that out because I agree completely with that. Uh, my position has always been pretty much those who are full time. I certainly don't think anybody working nine hours a week should be treated as the same thing as I, I don't know. I also I'm going to give my two cents real quick on the ESS. Now, this state publicly, I think it's ridiculous they're going to charge us an 18% upcharge. Um, they probably won't let me say that, but I do. And I thank ABM for not doing that, looking at what's best for their employees. And they've been very helpful all year long to us. Uh, I know it seems like we're giving a fee, uh, or they're collecting a fee off employees' bonuses. That's and a pretty sizable that's exactly fee, too. True. I mean, I agree completely. 13%. I just don't think that's right. I believe it's called a processing fee. Um, using them, um, uh, for our substitutes and for our permit paras, we call them pick paras, um, they do upcharge us uh, a percentage and that is so they handle they handle the hiring and, and insurance and all those things and that's I'm aware of how much money we spend with them. Um, we could potentially ask them to negotiate with us uh, if it is something the board would like to do. Um, we have we had discussed eliminating these pick paras and bringing them back in the house because of the situation we have with um, the CARES art money and the need for temporary help over the next few years. It seemed to be a smarter cost option, effective. more cost effective to because we, we don't know how long this will last. but. Um, to keep them as a temporary, what we call a temporary employee, um, because they also have other options. They can they can do other things with ESS, but ESS that way, bringing in X number of people, you know, we're talking about bringing in an extra 15 pair of pros next year, 16 pair of pros next year, um, and just having that many new staff, you know, causes us to have a lot of, uh, of work here. So right. that at that point, when you're doing all the new hire and um, all the background checks and all the references and all those things, they earn their money. Okay. And then they have to keep up with their time. And they actually bill us weekly. Um, so that is a process. They, they are a larger company. Okay. So they are working. They, there is 
uh, for, for the sub part and, right. and it's a constantly moving thing and short notice and it, we have a rip that works with us and that is that's a different story yeah but when you first said that it, I, I I had that same reaction it seems awfully high and kind of taking it I feel I feel taken advantage of to a certain extent I'll share some more information with you about something else in just a minute okay but um I, I, if y'all will let superintendent know yep. what we you just need, need to do. some guidance on okay. is this a what we want to do. 20 initiative or a 20 i mean excuse me a 21 20 initiative 20 or a 22. 22 initiative is it do we have support and y'all do not get to vote on anything today so um if it's something that we need to prepare a request to be approved <clears throat> we, we can think about it talk about it a, a 21 initiative would be made out before july 1. yes by june 30. so we would need to get it approved by what it is in order to do that in a kind of tight time frame every contract that involves we have to amend it um it has to come to the board for approval because it is not in not in what we presented you and at the same time we would ask for permission or approval to to pay the bonus too so we would bring it as a package um, once you get approval then we have to process it and get notify the company get an invoice process I don't know I don't know their turnaround time but I suspect it would be pretty quickly if we do the 20 individual ones that's going to take a little time because I think it's going to be 20 22 uh, well it'd be hard to get it turned around it, it is one of those June. things if we do the 20 individual ones I need to know how many of them are actually full-time and and I would like to get more feedback from the departments um, a lot of times contracted people make a higher pay rate than, than employees. Um, My one-fifth opinion is, um, one, I just like us to do something more here. And I'm sure they'd be happy if they get in June or July. You know, I think they'd be happy. Okay. I just, from my view, would kind of like it to stay in 21, if that's possible, with everybody else, you know, because everybody else would be paid their bonus in the FY21. But, it, it, but it's up to y'all what y'all can manage, I think is the biggest thing. I mean, if y'all can get it turned around, if, if not, then if I can do it, fine. If it was just the two companies, they already are aware that we're discussing this, and I think we could probably turn it quickly. When it comes to the 20 individual ones, then it's hurting cats. It's, you're trying to get everybody, hey, we've got to do an amendment. Why are you doing an amendment? They don't know about it. Um, that's a little different, and it's different departments it is tracking down all those people if if we're not going to do it with all of those and i can get a better number um i can i can give you a better answer as to how quickly we can turn it around i think we abm is a definite if we decide if you guys decide to do something ess is a definite and then on those other 20 just the full timers okay is that what i'm going to get a cost break down on that that would help I can I will pursue those um, I think full-time is fair I do. and that's something that is going into each contract to looking at the terms some of these contracts you may be contracting for 20 hours a month 20 hours a week I, it is going into the language each and every contract and looking at it and determining if they're full-time part-time could um, we just say fifty dollars or I mean just pull a number out they say fifty dollars seventy five dollars something like that for the part-time people you can um it's still an amendment to the contract i guess that's where i'm trying to go so create some for you. some of these folks it's may 27th they will not be back in our buildings until next year okay. so if you can't get them can't yeah i, I see get them. some continue to work here and some I think that's going to be significant, significantly less on the 20. Okay. The only ones that are part time are in the, that 20, right? Pardon? The only ones that are part time are in that 20, right? I mean, that's every contract that we had open that I could find. All the ABM and the ESS right. are full time? Yeah. Um, yes. <clears throat> yes. Well, I'm, I honestly, with ABM, I'm assuming they're all full time because we don't have access to I'm that, but we have the same people. That yeah. We can get an answer that quick. And um, if if 
y'all choose to do this. Do you want to use the same employment date that we did for our employees, which was 414? I think we should. Yeah. That would be consistent with it. Mm -hmm. okay. You had a cutoff date as well, right? Like if, let's say, somebody was a part of that group and they're no longer there. They're not. As long as they were there in that window, they'll. Um, what what the state when we received the uh, bonus money what they said was as long as they were still actively employed so if they have quit say they quit May 15th they didn't get anything if they quit between the time it was approved and we could get the checks out they didn't get anything because we had we had several people who um, had resigned in, in March and, and in different dates that they were not actively employed as of 414, then they didn't, they didn't get a check. But that was state rule. So follow the same guidelines? Yeah, I think so, yes. Um, <coughs> we'll roll into the next item, and that is not in our budget. It's not in 20 or 21s at this time, so whatever happens there, if we move on it, we'll have to ask for approval. Background checks. Something came up about background checks. Um, we have uh, our employees every five years must go get a new background check. I'm up this time too. Um, it's $55. You make an appointment with City Jasper and go over there and they do the check and then our folks will come up. Um, I had the question at number one, have we ever paid for these? Yes, we did. We did. They weren't $55. Then I believe they were 30, either 27 or 35 or some of both. Um, we had a grant, a safety grant, uh, I think it was Title IV, that paid for it for several years. It was part of the safety grant that, you know, check out our folks, make sure everything's good. The grant went away and we continued to pay it for a few years. We only paid it for employees. Now, we have between 125 and 150 employees every year that need to have a new background check. Um, we have all new employees get have to get a background check. Anyone who goes to work for ESS has to get a background check. If you volunteer and are with students, if you mentor, if you are a chaperone, you must have a background check. Estimating that number is a little hard because we don't pay for that currently. Um, City Jasper does it for 55 the cost is actually um, 43 no 42 to the state I believe it's 42 or 43 40 they actually they actually get to keep that other $12 so that's what they make off of us to pro, pro, uh, process it so <coughs> somebody said can we pay it can we yes it's legal uh, what would it cost worst case we're having to guess a little bit but no more than 400 a year. So that's about $22,000. So somebody said, all right, what about bringing it in-house and us doing it? We've looked at this three times. We do that, it's through the GBI. There are very specific requirements. Uh, the upfront equipment would cost somewhere without getting actual quotes, you know, because you have to know what you're gonna do to know what to purchase. Um, because you have to have fireproof file cabinets, you have to have the equipment to do um, the fingerprints, but it's somewhere between ten and fifteen thousand dollars. Then we are still going to pay the forty-three dollars. So that would save us a lot. No. Bring it, it in house. It, it would take years to recoup the cost of it. And again, then you always have supplies you have to buy. You have to have the ink. You have to keep the software. You know, renew your software every year. Things like that. So I had been asked kind of a menagerie of questions, so I'm kind of trying to hit them all. Um, can we do it? Yes. Is it legal? Yes. Um, it is a local item. It's, I can't use certain types of money to pay for that. Can I use floss? Um, I could possibly for the equipment, but I have to reread the referendum to see if, there, if that would allow me because it's kind of a specific item. Um, I don't have any grant money right now that can do it. Um, I don't think it would qualify for art or cares. I can't, I just, we just can't link it back to, you know, there's nothing about COVID that's making us do this. We've been doing this for a long time. So this would be a choice and it's a local choice. So can you guess how much would it cost up to 22,000? Um, and then it's, uh, you have to make a decision on 
if we were to continue to use the city of Jasper, would we just pay them directly or do you have to do reimbursements? Because that becomes another issue too. If we reimburse staff, that's another 400 checks that we're you know, writing a year and you have to have documentation and the state can audit are kind of particular about that. If we pay the city directly, we have to set up a system and we may have to have an intergovernmental agreement. That was something I was not sure about. Probably. Because they are government. So there, <coughs> there are some, can you do it? Yes. It might take me a minute to, to get that all figured out. We've done it before. Um, we can bring it in-house. You will have to have an employee. GBI has a nice little booklet on what you have to do. You get inspected. Um, if they don't like it, they can take it away from you. You get audited. You get audited. We get audited anyway, um, once, one, at least once a year. But that is a different kind of audit. It's more intensive. You have to keep them safe and secure. If you destroy them, there are certain procedures. We have looked at this several times. Um, we've not yet decided to do it. Um, so that again is going to be something I just kind of need to know. Y'all need to let superintendent know your thoughts. So the questions are, can we do it? And yes. then should we do it? Yes. Um, can we? Yes. yes. It is absolutely legal to do. Our determination is should we do it? And then should we? And then what version of it? Should, should it be in-house or stay with the JPD? So there are some options there. <coughs> so that is not in this budget. Just okay. to make sure. Everybody knows it's not in this budget. So if it's something we need to do, then I would be to add it. I think I know what my answer is, but we'll talk about it. Definitely not the in-house. That's crazy that we do. Never do that. Pay that one. For seven bucks? Well, that surprised me. I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. Matt, is it the GBI? Well, the state, the state, yeah, the government. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure which department, but um, well, not us. How many volunteers a year do we have that have to pay that? Anybody who, anybody who is going to have contact with kids. Um, I'm not like a parent who comes in to do uh, muffins for mom, you know. Um, field trip chaperones, field band trip chaperones, 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 anything overnight, anything. Um, I think if you chaperone on, on a bus, I'm trying to remember all the criteria, but there is a criteria, yep. a written criteria, that, and that's why it winds up being so many. We have a lot of parents mm -hmm. that volunteer and mentor and, and do things, and we don't, and of course, don't want to discourage that, but we do require. Um, Another option we could we could discuss later is um, maybe not paying for the employees since they're in, they do have in, uh, income, but for the volunteers, perhaps pay for theirs. That's uh, that's an in-between sort of compromise that we could discuss. I'm not advocating that one way or the other, but that's something we could think about. Um, and the cost might not be 22000 every year, but we do know we're going to have 125 to 150 <coughs> staff between um, just every five years you have to have it. Um, and new hires, it can go above, depending on, like this year, we're kind of light on new hires. Since we uh, contract out with Parapros, that has reduced some of our um, summer rollover. Um, but I will say this, ABM, I believe if I understood correctly, ABM covers that for their staff. Mm -hmm. They do. Uh, ESS does not. So that's just a little FYI there, too. Okay. Um, I was asked about driver's education. Okay, around 20% of county school systems in Georgia still offer driver's ed as a class. They might do classroom only, and they might do classroom and the driving portion. There, there are varieties of what are, what's being provided. From what I understand, I believe there are 37. Now this morning I had some, we've been, we've been chasing people on this. We had somebody contact us at the state level and said they thought it was only 32. But with DDS, Georgia Department of Driver Services, 37 county school systems are on record as providing a driver training school. So now maybe they're not doing it, maybe there are five that don't do it during the day. Now that is something I can't answer, but there are 37 who are approved sites. Um, we can earn a half a credit for the student for this class. Uh, it's a nine-week in-class session. 
then they do um, so many hours on the road if you choose to do that portion. You can just do the, the class. Um, I, I've kind of, I've got different information I'm going to try to share with you on this on what we were able to find out. Um, you must, we must, as a school system, have a certified driving instructor. And that means not certified with PSC. They can have any kind of certificate with PSC as long as a valid Georgia teaching certificate. I'm not sure if it has to be grade level appropriate, but we would probably <coughs> have to be. Um, we always had at least one person that you have to be qualified with Department of Driver Services. So they have to apply. There are a couple of small fees, nothing big. But they do have to take a test, they have to have a background check, they have to jump through some hoops, and I actually have a folder with their application process in it. I have not been able to do how long it takes to do this. The other part that could be a little more uh, uh, labor intensive and extensive is this, the school system. We have not had a driver's ed program in a long time and do not have anybody that it has been qualified. You had to do an annual re-up for that. Um, our driver's education bond with GSBA is not active or valid anymore, and I can get that back quick enough. Um, but you do have to meet the criteria first. But the school system, I'm not clear um, on whether we would have to recertify as a driver training school or if we would have to start over as a brand new one. We are not in their database that I can find. So that concerns me. Probably that, start over. Yeah. I'm thinking, and that's a little more intensive. That one packet's about this big and the other packet's about that big. Um, can, it, can it be done? Yes. Is it, is it legal? Is it part of the Georgia curriculum? Yes. Um, surround, close counties that do it are, or they're still active in the database, are Murray, Fannin, White, there's one more that was somewhere close by. There was one more, there were four in North Georgia that I pinged immediately. Most of them are uh, in middle South Georgia, um, but it is something that we can do. Um, we would have to make some decisions on how to deliver when it comes to simulators. Um, simulators can run anywhere from $20,000 a piece to $100,000. So not knowing a lot about simulators. Could those be bought with bust wash money? Possibly. Um, and vehicles. Uh, now vehicles, uh, we used to have vehicles donated to us by local um, car dealerships. We've had them from every car dealership. Two of the three have changed ownership since then, and I'm not sure how interested they would be, but we have not approached them. Um, I do not know what the student interest is in it. I will say this, one thing we were able to find out is a student can go online for free and take the driver training class. So what we provide in the classroom, they can do for free online. Um, <clears throat> um, there's a variety of ways it's being delivered in other counties. Some of them are helping students with maybe some after school or contracting with a driver's ed program to do it like on in the parking lot at a location at the bus shop. And you know, I mean, some people are partnering with um, groups to bring it in and doing it after the normal school day. We would probably have to have a minimum of one teacher, and I think you only have to have one that's that DDS license, from what I understand, but you can have more than one teacher. I believe we had two when we did it before. The problem we had with earnings with this, the way the class is structured, you do nine weeks in class, then you do nine weeks in study hall, or a nine-week class. We don't have a whole lot of those. So we paired it with help. Um, one, since we're on block, one or the other, either fall or spring FTE, we missed the cutoff for the nine weeks. So we only earned half of a half of credit. Mm -hmm. That was painful, and that was one reason this went by the wayside. Um, it, we, we simply could not earn it because the way the calendar was, we just did not catch the FTE count, so we couldn't earn the money. If it crosses the FTE count, we can. But that was the problem. One or the other missed it, and it would usually be by days, but one or the other would miss it, and then they would need to start the other class, and to get credit for the other nine-week class, they had to go ahead and transition. Either that or they were in study hall, which was another issue. Um, that means you have a class or two of high school students 
in classrooms with other students who are trying to learn something and they're in the back of the room or coming and going. That was, uh, from what I understand from some of the staff, that was not always great to deal with. So that's kind of the information I have. Now I have questions, if I can answer them, I will. Did um, we get a lot of requests for the driver's ed? It's not on the docket anymore, so uh, when I asked, they said, well, no, but there's always someone who asked, um, mm -hmm. you know, are we going to bring it back? Um, it's been gone long enough that I think people... It's been gone probably 10 years. Yeah, um, I actually could not pin down the last time we had it, but... Um, it's been a long time. Ago. Yeah, I would say at least... graduated on 2014, and some, at some point during his career he, he took it. I'm thinking sophomore year yeah. okay. so it was so 2012, yeah. 2013 was the last oh. school year they had it. Okay. 20, so it was the 2012, 2013 yeah. it was right when I was coming in. Yeah. Okay. So but I know we had great persis participation. We typically had two Oh yeah you had you had two, you said two. Um, I think you might have I know Ray Langley. I think you might have had three teachers more. I mean that was a lot of them. I know for years we had at least Or it could have been just a lot of ball coaches like Mm -hmm. drivers, yeah, there's, they, a, there's a lot of them down there. Yeah, they, the, the kids drove them to go get lunch. Well, so, yeah. the, the oh. online portion of it is free. Mm -hmm. right. The official driver's training is absolutely it's not. Right. Families are paying anywhere from $500 to $1,000 mm -hmm. for that training. I so it, it could be of tremendous value to, mm -hmm. to parents and community if we can hybridize somehow, make it work, and feed <laughs> all the classes. Take us. It'll take us a year to make it happen to get it into place for the 2023 school year. We can keep we can keep moving forward with it the, the and lock thing. it down and give you some exact figures and numbers. We can survey the kids, find out how many are interested, how many classes, how much staff. We can keep well, that working that. Probably the first thing we need to do is we can get into the school year survey. Yeah. Survey the the. the yeah. Well, that the, the, also well survey, I guess, freshman group. You get the mm -hmm. seniors and see how many people uh, see how many kids were truly interested in something. Like that. Yeah, I know well, that's kind of I, I'm at 15%. 10%. Well, yeah, it depends on the company, too, but um, that's a very good incentive. I mean, I know I've done that with both our kids. We did that with all of our two lawyers. I wouldn't be as concerned about the, the interest from the students as that would the interest from the parents. That usually impacts the parents mm -hmm. more. And if, if we could do something that would save parents five or six hundred dollars on their insurance, I would like to do that for them if we could. They're paying, right. paying a flat fee of, of anywhere from five hundred to a thousand dollars to these training companies, yeah. depending on how intensive the training is. Right. Save on the class. <coughs> And then say we're in insurance. We'll, right. we'll continue to do the leg work then. I'm going to do. I'm going to play devil's advocate just then. Okay. Um, a concern that was brought to my attention is if you if you add and you don't necessarily have to add staff, but utilize staff we have, it pulls students away from our other uh, offered classes. It and I, it it was high interest when we did it before. I do think we could have had three or four teachers and still had enough kids in there, but it's, it's going to pull them from somewhere else. Same number of kids, you know, if you pull a PE teacher, that's collapsing a PE class, or if you pull um, a vocational elective, it's, it could collapse some other classes. So that is something that was brought to my attention from the scheduling of it, because the way it was before, it was a sought-after class. And they would even give priority to seniors and then juniors and then sophomores and you had to be of age to be able to drive to do it um, but it will pull students from some other location and it's typically not academic because they know they have to have their academic courses so just kind of the flip side is you might pull them out of some of the other areas so same number of kids you know but if they're interested in their program anyway the way just just to, so you I'm have all the information. I what you're <laughs> and um, I was wondering too, like in the, in the schedules, and I know this wouldn't be known probably until uh, Mr. Wallace gets the schedules done, but sometimes I know their scheduling is in, in lower levels too. Sometimes there's a gap for a teacher that they are, they have, you know, they need an extra class to build their schedule, and hopefully you know, there might be something that, that teacher could do. 
they could have a full schedule. We can we can find out first how much interest there is, right. and once we've got those numbers, we can start looking at the impact on the schedule, impact on staffing. Well, I I don't think we offer any classes that aren't aren't important in some way right. or another, but th this is a this is a safety skill, this life skill that we have all used since we turned from driving age, and we continue to use it. At, it is required. I, I was thinking more light crossing on the side of our highway for kids. If, if we can do one thing, that we can prevent it, maybe prevent one. What's, what's that word? I was thinking the same thing. If we could impact one student who flies by me at 70 or 80 miles an hour in a, in a 50 zone, that would be, I think, a good thing for all of us. Now, the upfront cost, um, the way it, it even works with the earnings, with the FTE earnings. Um, any equipment, of course, and curriculum that we would need to provide, that would be, you know, we would just work into our budget. Um, you won't begin to earn that teacher until we hit really a year out. Um, but if you're just pulling them from an, if, if we can, a, if we're able to utilize our current staff, you're just, you're just rearranging. So, um, if, it, if it's, I don't, one of the things I couldn't quite get an answer to is, does every teacher that teaches it like if you had one that could do it for one period and then this one could do it for one period do they all have to go through that application process with georgia dds that i could not I, in all I, the stuff i read I could, you know if they would be willing to do it we could incentivize them to do it that might be the way to make it work if you had three four five that could move around to teach it during the day and they might enjoy it break up and the fees, get out of the house. from what I read on that side, the fees are minimal. Um, yeah, $55 background check, I think it was a $25 fee and a, maybe a $5. There were different little fees. Nothing was significant, um, what I would call, you know, anything. If I think I read it's all under 100 unless there was something that was not disclosed. So, um, but like I said, I could not figure out did every single one. So we are actually reaching out to some other um, school systems that are still providing it and we just haven't heard back from folks it's the end of school so we may have to wait a while but um but dds has not contacted us you uh, could do you know i know one of those teachers at least Brent Langley, i mean he was 49 percent i mean there's could be some options there where it's only offered you know two periods out of the day I mean, I yeah we can get creative once we know numbers right yeah. if we know if we know numbers I mean, we're not looking at this as a budget item for the coming year. It's, it's the year after, and that gives us a year to, mm -hmm. yep. to solve the mysteries that we, are out we there can. and get, get returned calls from the various... I, I think you could probably use WASP money to purchase those equipment. simulators and type of things. Yeah. Like equipment um, that will be used in the instructional classroom, yes. Um, that, I have no... no that really referendum is pretty flexible. Pardon? That referendum is pretty written pretty flexible. Um, one thing I know I can do with the referendum, if it is, if it's software that has to do with the initial install, we can cover that. You cannot do a renewable though. So, and you cannot do training, I believe. So you do have to kind of pick apart the quotes and I can do this, but I might not be able to do this 500, but I can do this <coughs> thousand. So we kind of pick it apart. Um, and if there's not an interest for me, the local, uh, local dealerships, A true driver's education vehicle with, the, with the, all the safety features installed for, for instructors. And I, when we, we were doing research, like I said, we were we were doing research with DOE, who did actually, it's funny, they called back today because I had one person working on that and we were trying to do the DDS part, but they actually called today. And um, there were some questions about can you use the simulator only? And from what I understand, that is part of the classroom, that you can't use that as the road test portion. So that is what I understand. I still want to pursue some of that. But so I think you are going to have to have some vehicles. But the simulators, last time we bought simulators, we had a grant for that. We bought either four or five for 100,000 of these. I will say if we do this, I do think we need to do we need to offer every aspect that the kids are required by law to do, whether it be the classroom and the driveway. There's no point that's offering part yeah, of it. Part of it. They have to still go somewhere yeah. else to, to, well, 
to meet all their requirements. Well, when I read um, that some of the systems um, were doing classroom only, um, and then I read with DBS that it's free online, I thought, why are you doing it? Because it's the other part that's the expensive part. That's the expensive. Mm -hmm. it's the, I think that the, the part that's free is the Joshua Law portion of, of that okay. bill that they passed several years ago on that, or the law that you were required to do that. You can do that and get your certificate, but I mean, you still got to do pay that. You, you still got to have your certificate right. of attendance. You got to, um, but that other portion, I think the value in that for the community would be rather than going and spending $500 upwards of that, if you're going to pay for your drug test too, that's another 75 But there, there's a value in that where you don't have to pay that and you also get the discount from the insurance. So that's a very big incentive. I know it was back then, like we've talked about, it's, I know that program is very popular. And if I remember right, upon completion of the, the course, we had a, some type of certificate that we would give the students to take with them to, whether it was to BDS or to um, an insurance company that approved. They could I remember it was a big deal because some would drive that they had to go pay for because they couldn't get in class. Right? And that's something that... For their birthday or whatever it was. Yeah. That I know toward the end, um, we would anyone who was 16 or over got priority if we needed 15 year olds we would of course an adult was in the car but we did have to start to prioritize who was allowed to take the class because you know you can't have 10 teachers doing it and nobody taking any other um, elective or academic course um, but but it, I, I know we did high interest when we ran it before we, we were never at a loss for students now when I, I still hear, I mean, yeah, I, it's not like I hear it a lot, but I hear from a lot of parents the, the cost of the independent training and why well, can't they get that back in school. I think most of just <coughs> got used to that being an expense to have to pay for it. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know that they should be in that situation if we can't offer it. Right, but there's something we can do to help on life too. We have time to talk about it. I appreciate all the information and the leg work you've done for us. That's great. Good information. I do feel occasionally it's like pulling teeth. Like you, huh. uh, and, and COVID has kind of unfortunately slowed down like response time for or getting a human being on the phone. Um, I have read and read and read on the internet and it's and pulled. I pulled information and we contacted this and that. But um, a lot of people are still working from home, or um, a lot of the Department of Education is working from home. So. Your only recourse is email, and then you have to wait. That's the other 180 counties are emailing them about something too. So we, we waited our turn and got some information. But but so I know this is not complete. But these are three items that uh, different people had asked for. So um, if if you want additional information other than the contracts, I'm going to check on those. We'll go through them one by one and see how many hours. So if they're considered full time, we consider full time 20 hours or more. Is that your definition of full time? Well, our definition of full time when it comes to employment is 20 hours or more per week. Is that your definition of full time? So when I look at these contracts, I'm able to make it. That's a good good question. question. That would not be my definition. <laughs> <laughs> so um, not I would go minimum 30. Okay. So maybe I can I can actually pull and we can list every one of them and how many hours. Like I said, some don't come every week, um, so it might be a monthly. But, um, but we can pull, we'll look them all. I immediately thought 40 hours when you yeah. said full time. Okay. I, I could probably go down 35, 30 maybe. But, um, okay. I kind of well, think 40, but I can offer 30. Well, you start having to offer benefits at 32 plus, correct? Um, actually, I rule now because of um, uh, ACA is. In your look back period if the average of your working time 30 hours or more per week is considered full time. Let's just go with 30. Okay. Let's do, that. Let's do 30. Okay. We'll give you a breakdown with the LORs. Okay. All right. Now, uh, if y'all, you have a green tab that says salary information. Y'all flip to that. 
Um, I wanted to go over just some information. The proposed non, uh, classified salary schedule um, has already been worked into this budget, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how it came to be. Um, Chris Parker, our personnel director, was integral in this. Um, what, and I'm, I'm going to read some of this, and I don't normally just read straight out of here, but I want y'all to understand the process we went through to determine uh, some of these hourly wages. Um, in an effort to help our classified employees reach a wage comparable to the surrounding area, we studied salaries of eight comparable county or districts: Gilmer, Fannin, Dawson, Union, White, Murray, Gordon, and Lumpkin. We took all the information we could attain and created an area average. We recognized that while some of our jobs' starting pay is comparable or better than the surrounding areas. The step increases for longevity were significantly less here than most surrounding areas. Now stop there for just a second. What that means, our current classified salary schedule for almost every uh, classified employee, the only increase they get once we bring them in is $125 a year. Now it's for 30 years, but you realize if somebody stays with us for 30 years, they're only making $3,750 more if we stick to that schedule and y'all don't do like a, a system-wide increase of some sort. So our steps, they're not a percentage, it's a flat 125 and they don't even notice it. Um, we have wanted to do something with this. This started during um, some of the, right before the economic downturn, it was supposed to grow significantly into a one and a half to two percent cost of living every year. Because of the economy it never happened since then I've just never really been able to get anybody behind this so mr. Parker said let me pull some information and let's see what it would cost so he started working this has been going on for months um, I'll read you the rest of this um, as a result of this study um, the proposed staff salary schedule um, would operate in a similar manner as the teacher schedule each job has a letter identifier with the pay scale. This scale gives a 1.5 raise annually. This raise would be attained by satisfactory annual evaluations. We think it will help create pay equity and reward longevity uh, as our staff will see a significant in their, uh, increase in their pay over time. The folks we have on board right now, what we did, we took every non-certified employee put them on the schedule after we had an average and there will be some if they've been here 30 years they don't get a one-time whopper they may get five thousand dollars a year but they've been getting 125 dollars a year for 30 years or the whole 30 years but since it's since 2001 or two this will be huge if, mm -hmm. if, if the board can support this this will be life changing for some of these people if they've only been with us a year or two depending on where the average fell nobody's going to lose money but there will be some that maybe don't get much or there may be some that get none at all if they're on step zero um, i'll give you an example the school bookkeeper schedule the starting pay is 1408 an hour that's strong across the counties but it's not after about five years and we lose people and then we have to retrain them which costs money and time um, but we, we can't sustain it Just, they get very um, after a few years and they're not getting any kind of raise they can see it they get very discouraged mm -hmm. and they start looking elsewhere or someone calls them and so they want to go somewhere else um, this is a, a method if you stay and you get your one and a half and i know one and a half is not the best increase every year but it's a heck of a lot better than what they're getting now and if we can do if we can pick this up we can increase that over time this is going to cost about four hundred and twenty thousand dollars for salary and benefits for those employees right now but it's in but the that's budget. already in the budget it's already in the budget so it's already been made to work in the budget yeah, the numbers that you guys have there, it's, it's already been incorporated. We weren't going to bring something we didn't think, and we started with 3%. <laughs> we started with 3. Um, we played with several numbers, and it, this one we could make work, 
Um, I, would, I know other companies have a larger step increase, but I, I, we need to do something, and we've not been in a position to for a long time. I think we have a moment when we are, um, and we can make it better every year. But we, I feel strongly that we need to take advantage of this moment and, and start something. Mm -hmm. After, after hearing that that was all that step they were getting for 30 years, I think I could die. It's, 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 it's already made to work. We, we, it's in there. Now, we may still have to tweak on a few things. Um, every single department didn't get to go over every single employee. We used averages. Um, I've gone through it. I've, got a, I've only got a couple of people that I kind of, mm, mm, you know, bless, what was your, what was the definition of this? What was the definition? We tried to place it, and uh, I'm going to go ahead. If you'll flip to the next page, yeah, the next the charts will help clarify what I'm saying. Um, this is the actual classified staff salary schedule. Each position, and they're all listed at the bottom, is given a letter, <coughs> and then you go to that letter and however many years service they have with us, and that's the hourly rate they make. So if you've been here 25 years, you know you may on be on D, and you go up here to 25. Um, you can see which which job, and we tried to do it by looking at the job description, the responsibility, and the hierarchy we already kind of have in the system. Mm -hmm. um, I'll also ask you to flip to the next page, and I want you to see the job comparisons. And there are two pages of, of positions that we looked at, and how they were. Um, what the average was. You have our current pay in green, the area average in blue. You have your eight counties and their ranges from uh, low to high, and then what our proposal is. Now, I'll say this. It's probably not perfect, but it's, I think it is a good thing. Like I said, there are some positions that maybe don't fit a perfect little box. We might have a few people that are kind of um, Oh, there'll be some people out of sync yeah. for a little bit, but for almost every employee, it is giving them a, a raise of some sort. Now, if you don't, if you're on zero and you're a brand new bookkeeper, you're on zero because we our starting is good on that one, and you you can see that across this. I think it makes sense. Um, I'm, I'm sure it's not perfect. I'm sure we will not make everybody happy, but I think it's fair. I think it's equitable, and I think it helps us retain staff. Um, I think. You will have most of our staff who are thrilled to see a new schedule where they can see, oh, in two years I'm going to make X amount more, or every yes, year I'm going to get this much more. Yes, the and the ones that have been with us a long time are going to get a sizable, yes. a sizable bump that first year. You've been with us 25 years. Many, many years I know at the high school, and us because we've had lost some really good I love players up front. It was because of Peggy and I. It never was it's a, it's something that's turned on. It was always it's just, I wish I could make more money. So, well, and it, <coughs> one, thing that's happened, thing um, one thing that's happened over time, just so all of you, some of you know this and some of you may not, um, we had a tendency to look at specific groups. We might address the bus drivers one year, and then we might address food service, and we might address pair pros, and we might. And there were lots of positions that just there was one person in or a few people in that we never really addressed that were right in the middle. Mm -hmm. And that's where we kept losing people. <laughs> um, and those are the ones a lot of times that we have to do extensive training with. And so we want to keep that. Every time we turn over a staff member, it's costing the system money because we've trained them. They may go to another system. Well, they're already trained. Um, it, it is hurting us <coughs> to have constant turnover. So, um, no, and, and by and large, these are the people that we, that we don't run without. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we don't have students without these people. I'm not, I'm not saying, I, I, I love our teachers, I love our certified staff, but these are the folks in Absolutely. the trenches who do all kinds of things, who go out of their way, who are so, truly support staff. You, all of us, and I'm, I'm a non-certified person, no admin are in here. Just so y'all know, no administrators are in here uh, that are non-certified. Um, but these are the people who get the job done, who are in the background, who are typically very quiet. They're the ones who run the buses. They're the ones who feed the kids. They're the ones that are the pairs in the classroom and wipe the noses and everything else that 
don't always get noticed. So I think now's a good time to do what should have been done a long time ago. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is I'm, fantastic. And what I'm hearing you say is this is sustainable. This is not just a one time thing. This right. is this, going to this go will year be to year. Place. Um, the bank driver schedule actually too is behind this. I've got the certified staff schedule and it, it, right now it has no changes. It just looks different. It's prettier. Um, and then the bus driver schedule with the increases on it. Um, all bus drivers do not work four hours a day. We do pay them based on what transportation tells us they drive. So every year I call Ginger and say, hey, I need, I need my list of hours. And uh, so we take care of those folks. But um, I think it's a good place to start, and I think now's a, a, a wonderful time. I think it makes sense, um, and I really hope it's going to help our employees. I think it's the perfect time to do it, and it fit in the budget. Right. Well, we, we have said for so many years, you know, we appreciate all of these people. They do a fantastic job, and, and we couldn't do, the teachers couldn't do what they do without them. But sometimes you need to back it up with money, and I'm so glad that we're correcting a long a long-term gap. Well, I think you go a long way, but it, in the work of my great-grandfather, yeah. <laughs> damn poor pay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I appreciate all the time that you and, and Superintendent Park. Young and everybody else has put into this, and Mr. Chris Park, Park and Susan Holloway. We have been on phones and short. emails. Um, we've had, there were others, but the primary ones were Susan Holloway in business services, Chris Parker. Chris can make it look pretty, y'all. I'm black and white. I don't frou-frou up and stuff. I know if y'all probably noticed, but he can make it look nice, and and um, so it, it's something that uh, I just I just fully believe in, and I think at this time, you know, it, it would if the super the superintendent is recommending it, if y'all would accept that this would be a great thing we could do. When it's time to vote. Yeah, I like. Uh, I, like I know what my vote's going to be. And like I said, I know we won't make everybody happy, but I think we'll have some, a whole bunch of happy votes. Um, let's see. I do want to just, uh, in the back of your book, you know, I always provide some um, information that you may need to refer to. Um, the FY21 budget is under the kind of teal blue tab. Uh, the FY21 amended budget, as it is at this moment, uh, we will probably have amendments again in June. And then our FY21 initial budget, just so you can see where we started and, and where we've amended to. The next page is our five-year history, as it, uh, as, our, um, it, as it was through 20. When we get to digest this time, they call it uh, 2021. We will call it FY22. So they run on calendar year, we, we run on fiscal year. But this is just so you have this information. Um, the next tab is our QBE allotment. We have the FY22 initial allotment. This is the official initial allotment. Um, I will ask you to look under, almost dead in the center where you see the thick black line, it says state funds at the top, and if you'll go all the way down to where you see a bracketed number, that's $996,668. That is our budget cut for this year. Now it was 2.4 last year, so they gave us back a lot of that, of our earnings. At the very bottom of that same column is what you'll see budgeted on that front page on the summary. I also included our FY21 midterm, so you could just have it for reference. The orange tab is weights for funding. If you want to know how much we earn at what particular FTE level, um, and you'll have kindergarten, kindergarten EIP, all the SPED codes, um, every way we earn money is on these six sheets. Um, the lighter orange, revenue code descriptions, just so when I call out all these crazy names and numbers that you can actually look it up later if you want to and say, what was she talking about? Um, but it's the state definition of the revenue numbers, and behind that in yellow are the expenditure numbers. Just for your information, as it stands right now, I know we may have a couple of changes, um, the cause of us offloading uh, those utilities of 900000 from m and to CARES, our salaries and benefits, you know, make up most of our budget. We're pushing 90% 
So 86 to 88 is normal, but with that CARES, taking that operating money out, that was a chunk, close to a million dollars. So that does uh, cause our salary and benefits to go up a little bit. Okay, salary average, you said 88 to 90? Um, 86 to 88 is typical. Um, we're at 80, over 89 and a half. Okay. But that's because that portion yep. of the five eight eight. Yes, eight because of the chunk out. of that operating yeah. money comes out. Um, now, when we um, fill in some of those blanks, that's going to change just a little bit, but it's still going to be in the 89% range, I believe. Well, what I'd like to say, too, is um, <clears throat> I know when, when elections come around, and not even just then, but oftentimes um, we'll hear comments from the community that uh, we've got to trim the budget, have too much fat in the budget and we've got to cut this out, cut that out, whatever. And a lot of folks don't realize that a lot of our budget is it, it's set. We really can't do a whole lot to it. Um, while we try to be very careful and we, we are very good stewards of the money, uh, if you want your student taught, we have to have a teacher there. And that's where the salaries come in. And that's 80 six to ninety percent of our budget absolutely um just for your information too on page one again um if you notice our expense for next year currently is less than what we asked for for last year what allowed that is the elimination of two central office positions um the elimination of pearson online and almost half a million dollars um, we reduced one counselor, one school counselor, that uh, was not something that we earned. Um, and one teaching position, at least, we get close to two. We had some pieces and parts that get funded, so I know people don't understand how you have a part of a position, but the way we fund um, it is reducing almost two teaching slots. So those are the reasons. That's over a million dollars. And that's with the that's with that uh, classified and in those numbers. It's all in there. So we're still down. And I've looked at it three times trying to figure out uh, plus and minus and plus and minus and um, the revenue being given back to us by the state was was essential in this happening. Um, we will probably have growth in the digest. Um, so as we fill in these other few holes. Um, then we'll get a solid number. We will need to have another meeting to talk about special revenue, which is lost, food service, and all the federal grants. Um, we're trying to, um, we're up to 12 federal grants under CARES and ARP right now. So we'll, we'll have that organized for y'all. That shouldn't be a long meeting, um, but we will have to meet one more time. At some point, once the budget is together and pretty well defined, now all the holes filled, um, we will need to have two public hearings. And that is where we meet, um, we open it up to public comment, and we listen. And then we will wait for the digest. Um, we can do a tentative approval before or after the digest. Um, if we do not have something in place or suspect that we will not by July 1st, we must in June approve a spending resolution. Sometimes just if it looks like we're not going to have one, we'll go ahead and approve at the regular June meeting a spending resolution just so we have it ready to go. If we do a tentative approval after that, that's fine. Um, but that way we know July 1st. I can't spend one cent without a spending resolution or a tentatively approved budget. Okay, July 1st. So. Are you looking to do the other budget? Tell me, tell me when y'all want to do it. it. That one shouldn't take long. I am out of town in June some, so, um, but pitch a date and uh, any time good, bad, do y'all want to pick a date now, wait? Um, we might be good to throw out some dates. We'll have a day. I know it took us a while to get down, but lifetime so yes. I'll pick, y'all pick one, tell me when you be here. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I, 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 I love that.
Well, of course, June 10th is the board is our regular board meeting. Um, we, Steve, thanks. We want to thank y'all for your support. The 11th, um, the 11th is in the 12th. Our GSBA conferences down in Savannah. I won't be able to make Monday the 7th. Not to do. Okay, how about Tuesday the 8th? The, uh, I've got three board meetings that day. Oh, you board meetings. <laughs> I could do, uh, how about Thursday the 3rd? I don't have to be, I'm going to be out of town possibly. Uh, okay. Uh, that first week into the 7th. But I don't, for that part of the budget, that's... Special uh, revenue is, is so, I mean, it, it is a lot what it of is. stuff to be crammed in there, but it's mostly federal grants right now. Um, now the CARES and ARC, we know the dollar figures. What I have, done, the tough part right now is just we've got to close one year and open the next, so I've got to kind of know how much we're going to draw down, but that's an estimate we can always be in. Food service. At all. Okay. I won't even be available for that. I, okay. can, what, that? I can maybe do that. I can. How about Tuesday the first? Can't do Tuesday. We have to have two weeks in between, the, don't we? How about June eighth? No, that's all I put the public here. Okay. Are you here June eighth? No, Tuesday the eighth wasn't going to work. He's got three board. I've meetings. got board oh. meetings going on oh, all day so long. Yeah. I can be in and out. What about seventeenth or eighteenth? No, she's I'm not. Yeah. When do you leave? Uh, I, I believe the eighteenth. How about the fourteenth or fifteenth? Sixteenth. Sixteenth. I think I could do 16. Uh, 16 is okay with me? Yeah. Okay. How about you? I can do that day. I think I can do the 16. Okay. I guess I should look at my calendar. Okay. What time? 1 o'clock spot. 1 o'clock. How long will that one take? Um, unless y'all have more questions about this and y'all, you know, y'all feel free as long as. Mr. Young is okay with y'all emailing me or calling Absolutely. me about anything yeah. I presented. If you have a question, please let me know. If I need to get more information that we need by that meeting, let me know and give me enough time to do whatever. Um, it's going to be, like I said, food service. They're, they're ready to go with their budget. Uh, supplies, we're still hashing out a few things on uh, timelines. I have no exact kind of exactly what I'm going to pay in that year. We're working on timelines. Um, a lot of that one's just going to be it's what it, it's, it just grants. is what it is with those yeah. federal grants. Yeah. Federal grants. So, so it's, it's not, it won't take long. It really just depends on if you have other questions about this part, if I need to, we've got to fill in a couple holes on this part and make some decisions on pick a year or are we going to do this or that or the other. I'll, I'll have to know anything that needs to go in this budget um, for sure. So would, you, would it be easier to have it later in the day for you guys? I, don't, I mean, I, 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 it's not so interesting. You know, one's fine. I can, one's fine. I can do one. One o'clock on five. Wednesday yeah. the 16th. That'll work. Okay. One o'clock Wednesday, June 16th. Here at the board office, the budget meeting. Sh should we, um, in the past, we've had our final dis discussion and then, and then afterwards we would have our first public hearing that would probably be wise uh, I, I will say yes we can do it that day but again any holes i have in this budget must be filled 